way that I do that it's great to be here at this lectureship and to hear these stimulating lessons given and uh, to be a participant in the panel discussions that we're having. And we're very deeply grateful to have the three brethren that we have today on this particular panel. Brother Larry Flood is going to be the panel leader. And then uh, these other two brethren, Brother Ivy Powell and Brother Michael White, will be participants with him. But then we want uh, everyone that's gathered here to feel free as time goes by to ask any questions that you might have concerning any of these subjects that are discussed. The overall uh, theme of this particular panel, of course, pertains to the New Age movement and certain facets of that. And these gentlemen are going to present about uh, five minutes each of what they have on their minds and hearts that were assigned to them. And then after that, uh, while you be thinking, if you have any question that you would like to ask, jot it down. And we'll have two of the students with roving microphones who will come uh, to you because we want everyone to use the microphone because all of this is being on uh, tape. And we want to be able to hear uh, the questions that are being asked. And so I'm going to ask the panelists to be sure and use the microphones up close where we can hear you. And then if you have a question, identify yourself, stand up, identify yourself, and then ask the question so that all of us can hear what is being asked. Without any further ado, we'll let the panel take over. appreciate the privilege of being with you this afternoon to discuss some of the particular facets of the New Age movement. As I began to consider preparing for this session, I, it occurred to me that the term New Age really is inaccurate. That the basic tenets and doctrines of the New Age movement, many of them at least, can be traced far back into man's history. This afternoon, Brother Ivy Powell will be discussing the subject of communication with the dead. The Jim, Brother Mike Wyatt, will be discussing reincarnation. And my theme for this afternoon is the subject of astrology. Astrology essentially relates to the influence of the heavens and heavenly bodies on the life, the events, the destiny of the individual. It's believed that the heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, the chief planets, move in a kind of path or belt to the heavens, and that the relation of these one to the other, configuration of these planets, at the time of our birth, affects, influences our personality, the events in our lives, and our destiny perhaps. The zodiac is the basis for astrology. The horoscope is a diagram of the 12 houses or divisions of the zodiac. If you read the paper regularly, you've noticed perhaps in the newspapers the horoscope that appears day by day. Many individuals read these with great interest and with great confidence. It's believed that the, by, the, by projecting the movements of the planets that one can even predict future events and thereby we have individuals who claim to have the power to foretell great events that are going to come, tragedies, calamities, and the like. I'm going to make just simply three, three assertions or observations concerning astrology in my brief time this afternoon. First is that astrology is idolatry. One cannot believe in the God of the Bible and believe in the power of the zodiac, the horoscope, 
and astrology at the same time. One may claim to be a believer in God, a Christian. And I understand that Gene Dixon does or did claim to be a Christian, a believer in God, at least at one time. But clearly the, the principles of astrology, the claims of astrology, are in clear contradiction with what the Bible says about God and God's power. One verse that comes to my mind is in the first chapter of the book of Romans. Romans 1, 21 through 25. We're told that when men knew God, they glorified him not as God. And verse 25 says that they worship and serve the creation of the creature more than the creator. That described astrology to me perfectly. Those who believe in this ascribe to the creation, to the heavenly bodies, to man himself, power that belongs to God and God alone. The psalmist said the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. The heavens do not possess power themselves. The heavens reflect the power and the glory of God who made them. In the second place, astrology is sheer folly, utter foolishness. I'd like to see a show of hands right now of those who are born April 20th to May 20th. Raise your hand if you would. How many of you were born April 20th to May 20th? Thank you. That's my sign. <laughs> You're full of bull too. <laughs> You're a t you're a Taurus or a bull. <laughs> you know, this morning I thought it would be interesting to, to cut the horoscope out of the local newspaper. And this I did. Hope my wife doesn't see it. For all of us Tauruses, here's our horoscope today. It's presented by Joyce Jilson. Keeping your word will attract a secret admirer. <laughs> That's good, isn't it? It's encouraging. I've been excited all day. <laughs> you should dodge unwelcome requests and make sure a new lover isn't already married. <laughs> so wives, if your husbands are a Taurus, keep an eye on it. But I think you can see how utterly ridiculous astrology really is. When you read the horoscope, and the predictions that are made, uh, how utterly ridiculous it really is. How in the world can planets billions of miles away, millions of miles away, influence personality, behavior, events? Well, the law said earlier that Reason is, logic is discarded. It surely is at this particular place. One of the planets, Neptune, not the farthest from the sun, but close to it, is about 2.7 billion miles from the earth. It takes 164.79 years revolve around the sun. The earth requires 365 in a fraction days. Astrology really, really is outdated. There were at least, or at least two planets, Uranus and Pluto, who weren't known, who weren't discovered at the time astrology was constructed. And yet men say that these planets so far away and that reflect the glory and the power of an almighty God who made them. That these control, these influence our lives. In the third place, I want to submit that astrology is appealing. It's idolatry. It's foolishness. It's folly. 
but it has an inherent appeal to people who want to know the future. Well, the Lord mentioned Eve in the garden. I know the fruit was pleasant to the sight. It was surely good for food. But I believe that it was the desire to make one wise like God. The desire to know the unknowable or the unknown. That perhaps pushed her over the edge. The Bible says, you know not what a day may bring forth. Thus don't boast of tomorrow. James says, you know not what shall be on the morrow. James 4 verse 13. The word of God says you cannot know what tomorrow is going to bring. You cannot know the future. But the astrologist says, yes, you can. The practitioner says, I can tell you what the future holds. And so people are drawn then to the idea of knowing something that isn't otherwise known. Astrology claims to open the window to the future, to future knowledge. Help us to know things others do not know. All we need for our well-being, our sense of security, our peace of mind, appears in God's word and God's promises. Trust God. Pray to the Father. Humble yourself before him. And the peace of God, Paul says, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, our Lord. I appreciate very much the opportunity of being, appearing on this panel, being a part of this lectureship. I have five to six minutes to discuss a subject that uh, is interesting. I find it very interesting that I am talking to you about communicating with the dead. Think about that a minute. Yeah, I think you're alive, but I'm not sure. But anyway, <laughs> uh, Shirley MacLaine is the uh, head spokesperson for the uh, New Age movement. I think all of us uh, are aware of that. Brother Laws did a real fine job on his uh, presentation of the material. And uh, most of us have been aware of the New Age movement, but it's been one of those movements that we attributed to folks way out in California. If you're from California, no offense. But uh, actors and actresses out there for so many years have played so many parts that they have just lost reality with reality. And so uh, they have taken on all of these parts. And you'll notice a great number of them have taken on Eastern religions. And what really uh, the New Age movement is, is a complete abandonment of God and the Bible. And so man wants to devise his own way. And as you well know, it is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps, Jeremiah tells us. Now, uh, the interesting thing about uh, some of their viewpoints is that they are trying to escape reality. Uh, as Brother Law has pointed out, it's difficult to define what the New Age movement is. I read a, a statement uh, when I was uh, doing research from Chandler, the book that Brother Law has mentioned, and he said that it is a hybrid mix of spiritual, social, and political forces. It encompasses sociology, theology, the physical sciences, medicine, anthropology, history, the human potentials movement, sports, and science fiction. In other words, every area of life. But if you were to ask one person who believed in the age movement, oh, do you believe this? They may say yes or they may say no. Because a lot of people would just take different parts of the movement and leave the rest undone. And it's a movement that's ever shifting. But now there are some things that they are in complete agreement on. Uh, they deny the reality of death. They don't believe that death is real. I wonder why they have funerals. I wonder what they think is taking place when they put a person beneath the earth. I, I mentioned in the manuscript, uh, what about those six million Jews that were killed during the Second World War? Was that a figment of their imagination? Or the folk up here in Oklahoma uh, that were killed by the bomb, some what, 168 of them? And uh, Shirley MacLaine really denies the reality of death. And so they are trying to escape death. 
But the fact of the matter is, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. Hebrews 9, verse 27. Uh, they are real big, uh, as uh, you uh, will find in a few moments, if you have not known, on uh, reincarnation. Uh, Brother White will have information about that. And uh, I'm going to deal with just a minute or two about communicating with the dead. Now, this is not uh, a new area right here. People have always tried uh, to communicate with the dead. And usually when we think of this, uh, we think of folk who are in a room and a woman with a veil on her head is looking to a crystal ball and she's moaning and groaning and trying to call up the dead. Well, actually, uh, that is what is called uh, trace channeling. And uh, a lot of these people will call to mind some uh, characters from centuries ago. Shirley MacLaine supposed to have contact with a 35,000-year-old uh, warrior king who was seven feet tall named Ramtha. Uh, if you believe that, I've got a white elephant out there for sale. And uh, then uh, there is Lazarus, and then there's Tom McPherson. These are three characters that the New Agers are always talking about. And uh, when, if you were to go and listen to these people, you could not go and sit in free. It would cost you. They would charge you anywhere from $100 to $400 to sit in on their sessions. And uh, one of the channelers uh, has standing room only, and he has referred his clients to other channelers. They are making multi, 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 multi thousands and thousands of dollars uh, upon this uh, false ideology and theology. So uh, the idea of communicating with the dead uh, it's interesting to observe when you read McClintock and Strong in their real fine work that they refer back to Constantine and how that he had abandoned this or told them to stop doing that way back then. As cited from Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, God forbid people to try this communication with the dead. Now, when you turn to Luke 16, I find it so interesting that the Holy Spirit had recorded here an attempt of a man wanting to communicate with people that were alive and he was dead. That is, his body was dead, his spirit was alive. And he wanted them to send forth Lazarus back and testify to his five brethren that they come not to this place. But do you remember what the Lord told him? If they hear not Moses and the prophets, they will not believe one though he rose from the dead. So if Shirley MacLaine and all of her followers will not believe God in the Bible, they're not going to believe anything. And so the emphasis must be upon what does the Bible teach. Uh, there is a great gulf, Luke tells us in Luke 16, verse 26, between the living and the dead, between Lazarus and between the rich man. There is no communication with the dead at all. God does communicate with us through his inspired word, Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 2. And as uh, Brother Fluid so ably pointed out, it's the word of God uh, that we look to for information that supplies them to life and godliness, 2 Peter 1, verse 3. It's the Word of God that gives information how to become a Christian. It's the Word of God that strengthens us and builds us up. It's the Word of God that answers real questions that uh, have always bothered man. Uh, why am I here? Where did I come from? Where am I going? Ingersoll looked into a grave, and as he looked into the grave, he said, Oh God, if there be a God. You see, there's always doubt in the mind of an atheist, but not in the heart of a Christian. And so the Bible gives us information, John 5, 28 and 29, that we are the promise from God that he will resurrect us from the grave. And in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, we will be uh, uh, clothed upon with a new body and we'll go home to be with God. Now, why would anyone want to give that up, Brother Maxey, for a philosophy that is based upon just uh, superstition, and the uh, imagination of man. We uh, must respect the word of God. That's all I got to say. My topic's on reincarnation. I want to thank, first of all, Jim Laws for not getting on my topic. I asked him not to, and he did not even mention the word. But I also want to thank him for all the good material he's put out this past year in 1997. I don't know if it was because of the lecture that he had or what, but he had a lot of bulletin articles and sermons and I, I called in and got some of the tapes and a lot of great material. Appreciate all the good work that you did on this. It's going to be a benefit to all of us. Reincarnation and the New Age movement, there's nothing new about it. It's old, but it is new. The idea is it's a matter of convenience. 
Some people have taken a lot of the old beliefs from some of these old religions, but you notice they're not holding to those old religions. It's a matter of convenience. They don't like some of those old things, and so it's no different than denominationalism. They change it, and they put something new in there just for a matter of convenience. Like, for example, reincarnation itself. In the East, it's mostly known as transmigration of the soul. And that's the idea where when you die, a person is born, they live, they die, and then their soul, that consciousness about them, and that's what the soul is there, that consciousness goes into, as far as transmigration is concerned, it can go into a human, it can go into a plant, it can go into an animal. But if you'll notice and study about reincarnation as far as Shirley MacLaine and the New Age movement, apparently they don't like the idea of going back to an animal or to a plant. And so their idea of reincarnation, as far as the West is concerned, is just that reincarnation just deals with the human soul. That consciousness goes to another human, and then to another human, and then to another human. They don't go back to the rat. You know, and then if you're a good rat, then you might be a cat. And then if you're a good cat, you might be a cow. And if you're a cow in India, you're in Fat City. Man, you got it made. But they don't like the idea of that. They just want to keep it with the idea of the human soul. And so you don't, you don't deal with, as far as in the West, Shirley MacLaine and others, you don't deal with the idea of going back into an animal or to, to a plant or something. In fact, you stick with the human soul. And so it's, a, it's based on old religion, but it's all new. It's a matter of convenience. And again, if their basic doctrine is everything is relative, it doesn't matter anyway. And so they can make up just whatever they want to. As Brother Jim pointed out in his lesson, about 30 million Americans believe in reincarnation according to Andrew Greeley and the work that he has done and, and I appreciate uh, that good work as far as explaining a lot of the things that people believe today. Now the idea behind reincarnation is that a person's soul progresses toward perfection or salvation. Basically it comes down as far as the West is concerned and the New Age movement, it comes down to the idea that you, you live a life and during that life you do things wrong. So when you die and your conscience then goes into another human body, you're going to have to pay the price for all those sinful things that you did. Now, that next life you live ought to be a better life. But you still can't pay for all this, the wrong things that you did and in the next life as well, and then in the next life and the next life. So you go from one life to the next, and here it is, atoning for your sins, atoning for your wrongdoings. And so hopefully, with the many lives that you live before long, maybe in several different times, Shirley MacLaine says she's uh, been in at least, she's been a man twice and a woman once, and what is she now? Nobody knows. It's all relative anyway. But the idea is that you continue to go from, from body to body until you get it right. Now, what's so amazing to me is one of their basic doctrines is truth is relative. If there's no absolute truth, how do they know if they ever get it right? And so when they say, you just, you know, the longer you live, Shirley MacLaine says, uh, uh, the longer you live, the, the better chance you have of getting it right. According to what? There's no truth. There's no absolute. Well, that goes along with uh, reincarnation as well. I appreciate uh, Brother Law said in, in the last part of his uh, uh, book, and it's in there, to, that we need to define our terms. We need to make sure we're talking about the same things. And you'll notice in the book, in, in the part that I have, I have a glossary of terms, and it'll help us in understanding what they're talking about, what we need to talk about. Reincarnation, the belief that on death an individual can be reborn in another lifetime as a human on this planet, or possibly on other planets. So that's another story. Isn't it? Then there's karma. Karma's the filthiest joke Satan's ever played on mankind. The idea that we've got to atone for our sins, but you can't really do it. You've got to live lifetime after lifetime. Shirley MacLaine says one lifetime is enough. You've got to continue to live time and time again to get your karma right. And each life you're living is you're living out karma guilt. And that's why some of you have been over to India and you've seen those starving children over there. And there are people in India who, who have the money to help those people, who can relieve that affliction and that suffering. But who ends up doing it? A lot of times churches do. We do. Other people do. Why don't the people who live there, why don't they take care of these things? Because of karma. 
They say that's their that's their thing. They've got to suffer and they've got to be afflicted because they lived a terrible life last time. And they've got to pay for that. And if I help them by relieving their affliction, you see, then they're just going to have to suffer more next time. Their next life will have to be worse. So why do those people pass them by? Because of karma. That's why I call this the filthiest joke Satan's ever played. God sent his son Jesus Christ to pay the debt, to take care of our sin problem, and help us who are lost to be saved. And they say that's not possible. Because you've got to go from lifetime to lifetime taking care of this karma. It's your guilt. You've got to atone for that. And hopefully you'll reach the point, and how far that is, no one knows, but you'll reach the point of, point of eternal bliss. You will have atoned for all of your evil deeds and all of your sins, and hopefully then you'll reach nirvana. You heard that word before, haven't you? That's one of our glossary of terms too. Deja vu. How many times have you said that? I've said it several times. Didn't even know, you know, just, you know, deja vu all over again, you know. I didn't know what it meant. Here, this French phrase which refers to the sin... Thank you, Jim. This French phrase which refers to the sensation of living through an experience for a second time is given special meaning in reincarnation. The interpretation that many deja vu are, in fact, subconscious recall of episodes that happened to the individual in an earlier lifetime. I'm going to do my best not to use that term anymore. Because the New Age people, it means reincarnation. And they would think that you accepted that. Then nirvana for the Buddhist, the ultimate goal of perhaps many lives. Here all is absorbed into the bliss of total oblivion. The individual soul exists in the totality of all souls. All is peace. The cycle of rebirth is stilled. Finally, when you reach nirvana, you, you won't have reincarnation anymore. And there are several other things. Extra cerebral memory. Why don't people remember their past lives? Some, they say, do. Others don't because it's your cerebral part of your brain that remembers things and it dies with you. So how can they say somebody can remember a past life? Well, they come up with something called ECM, extracerebral memory. And since your cerebral dies and you can't remember, you've got extracerebral. I thought that was very nice. If a person has a, br a brief flash or glimpse of something that cannot be linked to the present, it is categorized as having come from a previous life. You ever had those instances before? They've made up categories of all the things that have to do with reincarnation, and that's one of the criteria they do. Then right as I close my part here, I want to read the fly leaf. Uh, well, it was on the front flap and the back flap of Lives Unlimited Reincarnation East and West. And I quote, Have you ever visited an unknown place that seemed strangely familiar? or thought you recognized another person even though you've never seen them before, or felt an inexplicable acquaintance with events of the distant past, then you may have touched for a moment the mystery of reincarnation. Here Dr. H. N. Benerji of the Indian Institute of Parapsychology and Will Osler present the results of years of carefully documented study of reincarnation around the world. A child in India, a teenager in New Hampshire, a man in Turkey, all have relived, if only fleetingly, the experiences of a previous life. And then just to see how far all of this goes, here's something that didn't make the book. I may have run out of time or space there anyway. Emmett Fox, in a pamphlet on reincarnation, says this, and I quote, Always remember that at the moment before birth, one is dealing not with a new soul, but with a mature soul the product of many lives. And he continues, Now we are ready to understand the startling statement that there is no such thing as heredity. This statement will surprise many. But it is true, he says. No one ever inherits anything from his parents or his ancestors. He already had certain mental tendencies before he reincarnated this time. And these tendencies guided him to a family where similar tendencies existed. That is all. Makes you think about that child, you know, that hadn't turned out maybe the way you thought. You know why now. It's got nothing to do with you, parents. I mean, it was something you got from a previous life. I've got some other things to say, and we'll do that perhaps as the questions come along. Appreciate their presentations. I don't think either any one of us up here think we have all the answers. Uh, 
were extremely humble at this particular point in time. We'll be glad to answer any questions that you may have if you'll uh, if you'll raise your hand. Uh, my name is Doyle Bruce. Uh, it's a question it's concerning horoscopes. And I grew up being taught horoscopes and all that kind of stuff of the devil and have nothing to do with them. But almost in a, on the other side, uh, Farmer's Almanac. I would know people who would say, you don't plant your potatoes unless you do it by the sign or, you know, dehorning cattle or whatever it may be, you have to consult the almanac. And I wonder if there's any relationship and, uh, you know, kind of what to think about that. So in the same situation, my father wouldn't do certain things, mark cash, whatever, unless the sign was right. Uh, there's no question but what I think, for example, the moon affects the tide, does it not? The pull of the tide. Uh, the planets have certain effects on the physical uh, aspect of, of the creation. But to say that it controls our thoughts, our actions, our personalities, our behavior, events, uh, this type of thing uh, is quite a different matter. You know, I was talking about the fact that um, they believe those born under the same sign, uh, their life can be predicted in along, pretty much the same way. You know, what, what about twins who are born? If, if astrology is correct, then twins should live, live parallel lives, should they not? Born at the same time, same parents, same place, only minutes apart. Look at Jacob and Esau. How many twins do you know whose lives are very, very different? Uh, there's no question, I think, but what there are certain influences on the material creation, uh, but quite apart from the spiritual. Uh, Mike, you might want to answer this. Uh, I have heard of some here over in the West that believe that cats and dogs and animals have souls. Uh, Genesis 1.30, Brother Law is referred to, I believe, in his, uh, his uh, lesson earlier, says that every creature that God made there uh, in him was life. I believe the Hebrew word might be translated soul in some places. There may be other passages in the Old Testament that speak of the life or souls of animals. Uh, what's the distinction between the soul of the animal and the, the everlasting soul that, that man has? You wouldn't have asked that if you didn't have an answer for that. I really believe you know the answer to that. The only way I want to deal with that right, right at this time is to talk about what I mentioned a while ago about the conscious. That's what they mean as far as the New Age movement is concerned, as far as the soul. It's not the soul as you and I understand the soul. The soul is going to... When we die, our soul's going to go back to God who gave it. We're going to give an account for the deeds. Nowhere does it say anything about animals having that kind of accountability to God for, with, with the same kind of soul. So they have a life, but not the soul as that regard. And then the New Age movement's talking about the conscious. It's our conscious that leaves, leaves our minds and goes into others, which is, this is just a physical shell as far as New Age movement is concerned. And, and uh, it's never going to do anything, it's going to go away, it's our conscience that's alive, and that's fine, except uh, our conscience is not going to go from life to life, it's going to go back to God and give an account. We never find anywhere animals where, that where animals are going to do that. Airborne McCullough, Mike, uh, in your regards to uh, reincarnation and on karma, karma does not have a, uh, a soul what I've read so far, it basically is stating that it is the spirit that reunites with the uh, ultimate one. And from that uh, emanates then a new life. And <clears throat> you might uh, classify it as uh, uh, karma as an action, causation. And so I have a, I have a, I think it's a little bit of a misconception uh, it took me many, uh, many years reading. I, I held the same view, too, that, that this uh, reincarnation, it was the soul, but it's not the soul that they're talking about. The Hindu, uh, the Buddha doesn't uh, refer to uh, uh, a soul uh, at all. It's basically once one achieves a state of what they call the final bliss, then you have returned to the ultimate creator. And... All of this that we 
are in today is nothing but a play of the Creator. He's playing a, 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 a theatrical play, if you will. It's, uh, and they have uh, they make reference to that. This is a, uh, a field of lolly. And uh, we have a concepts, our concepts then become uh, distorted because of, uh, of a maya. That is, those things that we try to look at from a reasonable standpoint, a logical standpoint, brings about frustration, anxiety, and, and ultimately death in the whole thing. And so... You never talk about the ultimate creator. You don't return to because all is God, everything. The universe is God, everything's God. You just return back to the universe. Your your conscience does. Uh, so as far as reading about the soul, you're right there about not they don't talk about the soul, but it's their conscience which they also believe is their soul. So it, it all just returns back to the ground, the dust. All of this plays a part and it, as the zodiac comes in, uh, it's because basically all of the zodiac uh, and uh, that area from from the mystic points of view they they have everything related to sevens okay so that's why there's only seven planets it's not that they did not know that they were there uh, what I've read they even knew beforehand that there was more than seven planets but they, they couldn't have <laughs> uh, pass that to Jim I think Jim had something to say about Jim Laws <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a difference to be or a, a distinction to be made between classic Hinduism and New Age movement. Uh, New Age movement of course has taken bits of Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism and these Eastern Oriental religions and modified them and, and reclothed them to meet more of the Western mind and suit and fit the Western culture. So it's easy to to jump one horse and ride another when you talk about Hinduism and New Age because New Age has really changed and modified a lot of things but they borrowed heavily upon those things. Um, for instance the uh, view of karma and reincarnation uh, to the New Age it's very optimistic. Uh, your point Mike was a very good one in that they very optimistic in saying you're getting better and better. Traditional Hinduism though says uh, reincarnation presses you down. You go to a lower form of life and a lower form of life to pay for your sins basically because you have an evil karma or a bad karma. But New Age movement has twisted that around and it has more of an optimistic approach toward karma and reincarnation. That just illustrates how that it is heavily borrowed from these classical Eastern religions, but it's twisted and changed. So we have to keep that in mind and in focus when we talk about it. They're absolute. There's no right for them to get it right on. They just, they go out of existence just to come up. Blend in with the universe. Right. It all well, is one. That's why would anyone want to become a part of something that they go out of existence when you can become a Christian? And live forever. Yeah. I mean, there's no comparison as to what the Bible offers, uh, so what God offers through the Scriptures, as to compare to what these New Agers offer. Like Jim had made the comment about uh, Shirley MacLaine and saying she is God. It's in her book where she stands on the seashore and her teachers there saying, "You got to really believe this." So you really shot it out, and so she's up there shouting out, "I am God! I am God!" And I read Psalm chapter two where it says, "God sits up in heaven." <laughs> And he laughs at the practices of the heathen. And don't you know, you know, here's God in his immensity. And here's Shirley MacLaine that's no bigger than the, the sand she's standing on, according to God's immensity. And she's hollering, you know, and God's looking down on this. And he hears this voice, I am God. You know? And God says, Gabriel, Michael, come look at this, you know. Kind of puts it in perspective, you know. Here she's saying she's God, and God's looking down on this and saying, you know, that's, uh, and, and laughs at the uh, heathen, heathen's practice. Uh, yes, sir. My question has to do with uh, where do they, the New Age people say that uh, when you, when a person dies, does their being or spirit or whatever they want to call it go into another body? At what point does this go into in reference to a baby being conceived or a baby being born 
in, in regards to abortion is, and I know a lot of New Agers that hold that abortion is, you know, just fine and dandy. Well, what is their view on when the, does a soul go to a certain other being, and if it is at a conception and they're killing themselves? Earlier about the categories that they put in this, they use for all these, and it's in the book. And in fact, some of the categories show that it has to be instantaneous. Like one man said that he is a reincarnation of, of uh, Mahat, uh, what's his name, Gandhi? Yeah, that's it. And uh, so, you know, people were believing that, they were accepting that, and they were fixing to worship this man. And finally somebody did some figuring and said, wait a minute, uh, Gandhi died at a certain day, a certain time. Uh, you know, this guy didn't come along till you know, two weeks later. He can't be it. So, you know, there, there's got to be instantaneous. As soon as you, according to their belief, you're born, you live. As soon as you die, your consciousness immediately goes to a, another body somewhere that's got to be being born the same time, the same exact time. Thinking, uh, we've all had a, a good chuckle at this and, and because it's funny, and it is funny. But I was thinking with a, an approach to people that take it seriously, based on your study, do you think, uh, Ivy kind of hit on it, uh, uh, that an approach to them or an effective approach to these people might be to, to try to point out that, uh, for example, something about communicating with the dead. Well, you know, most of the time, say in combat, the, the guy that's dead is the one that stepped in front of a bullet, and I don't know that I want to ask him anything. Uh, and not, I wouldn't really put it on that term, but in other words, he hadn't been successful, at least up to now, in that he's out of this world, and uh, he didn't make it here, so I don't know why would, anybody would assume that they have an insight into our world, is what I'm, I'm trying to get at, maybe hit at that a little bit, and then with the idea of karma, that just looks like double jeopardy, it's, it's kind of like a credit card, you know, you just get into this 22% interest, and man, you're going down. Excuse me, Ivy, but the one point about that, as far as the... Uh... Uh, the fellow who, he didn't make it. You know, what, so what, what in the world would you want to ask him? The fact is, they don't, they believe that you don't remember your past life anyway. Now, Ann Bazan, or whatever her name is, it's in the book, uh, written over 300 books. Uh, she's the president of the, the, the uh, Theosophical Society, and uh, she's talking about, here's how you, here's how you know. Uh, in the East, they believe in reincarnation totally. And so when a child comes up and starts talking about his past life, they just accept that. You're, oh, yes, yes. And then they continue to believe that and think they can remember. They said, now in the West, a child comes up and starts talking about their past life, and the parent slaps them. Says, you know, what are you talking about? That's crazy. And so the child says, well, then I must not have been. So they forget all those things. The problem is, is they say you're, you, you die, and you can't remember your past life in the first place. You remember when they talk about God, God is everything, God is a force, God is an energy, Luke Skywalker, you know, the force is with you, it's in the trees, the mountains and everything, so empty your mind, he's, you know, become stupid, that's what he's saying, you know, just empty your mind, don't remember anything, and so that this force can come inside you, well that's exactly what reincarnate, they don't remember from one life to the next, and yet the next life they're supposed to get it right, and they can't even remember what they did wrong in the previous life. And the idea of karma, and, and if I mention, if I act like this was something funny a while ago, uh, I said this is cruel. That's why people in India who have their children, they, the karma is they're a beggar, they're going to be a beggar all their life. That's all they can be. They can't be anything else, so they might as well be the best beggar they can be. And parents have taken ch their children's fingers and cut them off and have broken their limbs so they'll look pitiful and people feel sorry and they'll be better, better beggars. So it's this, I'm sorry if, if I made it sound like it was funny and we had a laugh about it, I... I had a laugh at Shirley MacLaine because I think she's funny, but uh, as far as the, the doctrine itself, especially at karma, it's the saddest, one of the saddest things I've ever studied before. Tom Gray from Louisville, and uh, it seems though that uh, there is a feeling uh, by some who study the Bible that the, that the Hadean world, uh, as we talked about in Luke 16, uh, is a figment of imagination and that it is a parable and uh, not a story. And uh, I'm wondering if you'd make a comment on that. Uh, is there, a, uh, according to the scriptures, a definite waiting place for the spirits bef before the great judgment day? First of all, it's not a parable. I believe the Lord is teaching a real life story there. And you have uh, people that were alive upon the earth 
You have people that died. You have uh, people that were awake after they died, and they were in two different places. And uh, so uh, there is definitely life after death, and there is consciousness after death. And uh, those who uh, believe in communicating with the dead, of course, sometimes uh, they'll turn to 1 Samuel 28 and try to make a comparison with uh, communicating with the dead and the witch of Endor, but there's no comparison at all. Because when you study that, uh, it was God, not that woman, and it certainly wasn't the devil that called up Samuel. And so, uh, yes, I believe Luke 16 is a real story. I would agree with that. Uh, he gives a man's name, which is unusual for a parable. Christ said to the thief, this day you'll be with me in paradise. And then in Acts 2, of course, his soul wasn't left in Hades, or his flesh see corruption. So I would agree with Brother Powell. Anyone else? Right here. I've got a couple of questions. Um, do most New Age people believe in reincarnation and talking to the dead? And if so, how can they talk to the dead if they're immediately in another body? And also, uh, if you could comment on the effects of the New Age in the church and how uh, relativism has played its part. One of the categories that are mentioned in the book uh, concerning some of the uh, categories of reincarnation, and I can't even pronounce it, uh, BM uh, UT, uh, this certain man who was an epic hero, is claimed that he, uh, he was told that he was going to uh, be a great, uh, great soldier and all, and he became that. And, and then his dad had died. His dad was a great hero too, and he began to, to speak with him from the dead. And the uh, only problem is, is he was doing real well in the battle one time, and then he kind of got confused at uh, what he thought was his dad's instructions. And the enemy took advantage of that and, and, and won the battle and, and killed him. So I'd have to say he had a little psychic confusion there. You know, it didn't work out that communicating with his dead dad, he got him killed because he didn't, didn't get him the message very clear. Uh, New Age, the reincarnation is one of the basic, I think Brother Laws had six or seven in the book. I've come up with five, and, and this is definitely one of them. And when you consider that, you know, everything is God, if you want to get rid of God, what are two things you do? You either say nothing's God or everything's God. And uh, that's what they've done here. And when they believe these five tenets, and that's what New Age Movement is all about, there may be somebody out there who says, well, okay, I go along with it, but I don't go along. Why not? If truth is relative, can you imagine raising your child saying, there is no truth? I don't know it, you don't know it, never will. So you just go what you want to do because your opinion is just as good as mine. So they may... You know, some of them may not think that, but no, I, New Age movement is re reincarnation is one of the major tenets, and you can't uh, can't have it without it. I don't believe. The way to meet these people, I really believe, is uh, how Brother Laws ended his uh, wonderful lesson, is to meet them if they would meet uh, some of us in a public debate on the inspiration of the Bible. That's the battleground right there, isn't it, Brother Laws? Because the Bible is either the inspired, inerrant Word of God, or it is not. And uh, so uh, if they would be willing to make uh, such a discussion, then uh, that would be the only way to make any headway with them. But I believe that the, the ones that the new age people target are not, for the most part, older people's in, people in the church. They want the, uh, the young, the well-educated, people that are disenchanted with religion, uh, that is, have, sour, uh, have a sour, bitter taste in their mouth. And so they go and they start working on them. I think these are the prime target. But as to its effect within the church, in your research, I'll ask you a question. Uh, in your research, have you found that it, uh, this uh, philosophy has made much movement within the church? Would you speak on the microphone? More so than we realize, because we have, by osmosis, I say, uh, accepted uh, tenets of the New Age movement without realizing it. Um, uh, how many of us have not heard that song? Uh, it is the dawning of the age of Aquarius, and it's a very popular song. And, and uh, they have taught their view through the music, through the cinema, through the um, printed word. And just as Israel was in Canaan, 
and Canaan rubbed off on God's people Israel. So the Lord's church is being affected by the teaching of this and other false views, and naturally it finds itself in the church. I think it's clear whatever is in the world is going to be in the church to some degree sooner or later, including the New Age movement. Before you get to him, I mentioned five points that I wanted to bring out as far as the New Age movement. You might jot these down and because they fit right along with what Jim put in his. Number one, truth is relative. Number two, God is impersonal. Number three, and that's the idea like back with uh, Star Wars, you know, God is the force. There's no one thing. It's all, it's all in the trees. It's in the birds. It's in the flowers. It's in everything. Number three, all is one. Number four, reincarnation. Number five, conscious or cosmic consciousness. And that's the idea that, you know, we're in, we're in charge of our lives, so to speak, as far as our brains and our minds, our conscience. We're at the keyboard of our brain, and we're tapping things out. But we can, through meditation, they claim, and, and through uh, sensory perception and all of these things and drugs and everything else, they can, uh, they can just kind of move out of their conscious and let someone or something else in there, and then they start controlling it. Now, Question, where do these people get the idea about seeing the UFOs and the people who have these psychic phenomenon happening in their life? You say, how can they come up with that? Well, believing this by thinking they can just move out of their conscience and let the world get in there, what else would they have in their mind? So that's where all of these, you know, meetings with UFOs and, and they talk about the crystals. You talk, you've seen the crystals on these uh, psychic people. They're, they believe that there's some kind of force inside the crystal and so they put it on their... You know, you used to could have one on your on your cabinet there, and you could go down to the rock store and buy a quartz thing for about two or three dollars. You go to a new age store, and it costs you about two, three thousand dollars, because it's got some kind of psychic force with it, and you can you can really be in with the universe if you have this vibration coming off this. And people are moving up northwest to I think that's where Mount Rainier is, because they said there's psychic vibrations coming from that, and you can really you know understand the future and everything else. People who won't accept the truth, who love error, they're going to be sent a strong delusion and they're going to believe a what? New Age movement. Uh, the question that the young man asked right over there a few minutes ago, I'd like for you to answer that one a little bit more, maybe to my understanding. Uh, I thought it was good. I'd never thought of what you said, the fact that they do believe in communicating with the dead. Yet, one of the statements that Mike was talking about a while ago was that this change of one being into the next being at the point of birth is instantaneous and one must be ready to accept that particular soul, spirit, whatever, uh, at, rather than it laying in wait somewhere. Uh, I think that that would be a point that one could capitalize on real well in, in pointing out a glaring error in somebody's thinking and saying, hey, you know, if you're going to speak to the dead, you gotta you gotta find another place for that spirit to be awaiting to be born again. Any other questions? Back here. Death and births, I suppose. Is that right? Is there ever a new life? Is anybody ever actually born? Anybody new coming into the world? We just recycled, I suppose. Uh, <clears throat> go ahead. Uh, a question. I think we can all make a distinction between music we enjoy, New Age music, John Tesh, to the contrary, notwithstanding, so forth. Uh, at what point does the exclusivity, mutual exclusivity of Christianity, the New Age movement, where do we make a distinction between New Age-ism, if I may, and uh, good literature? J.R.R. Tolkien, for example. Uh, the Star Wars. I, I'm, I'm a fan of Star Wars. I, I don't see the problem with that. Uh, but I do see that there's other literature where there is a problem, uh, cinema and so forth. So where would you make that distinction in your discussions? Star Wars had a lot of good, a lot of good action in it. Had a decent, had some kind of story to it. But when you look at the things that were behind the scenes, do you go along with the basic concept they were trying to put out? Of course not. About everything is God. There is no personal God. Uh, it's he's impersonal. He's a 
vibration, he's an energy, he's a force. I think we, as in anything with the world, we're, we can't be of the world, so we've got to be just real careful. You can watch Star Wars and enjoy the movie, but don't, don't let the, the, the teachings that are behind it, and now whether Lucas had that teaching in mind behind it or not, I don't know, but that's certainly what's prevalent in it as you look back on it and know that's exactly what they were teaching. So you're just going to have to be very aware and be very careful and not allow yourself to start believing those kind of things. I think you've got to be educated. Sure. Wait, wait till the microphone, please. I'm sorry. I think we as students of God's Word, we can make that distinction. But my question is, uh, in our discussions with the New Age people, those who have bought into the philosophies, uh, how do we make the distinction? Do we eliminate all the, uh, the, the, the fantasy literature, as I mentioned, J.R.R. Tolkien and so forth? Uh, how, how do we deal with these people on those issues? I think we can understand it, but we're dealing with a lot of people who are not... Uh... And we understand it, but then what about our influence? And if we're leading someone into believing that we're not, we're not understanding that false part of it, uh, then, then we're just we're guilty too by, by our influence. So I don't know where the line is drawn. I think we just better be careful and be knowledgeable and be able to tell people, teach people exactly what, uh, you know, there's a doctrine that's coming out. Did you catch that? And uh, I caught it. Hope you did too. And, and I certainly have nothing to do with that. So we just got to watch our influence and be very knowledgeable people. Uh, M.L. Sexton. And the thing, I, this is not exactly a question, but it's a point that uh, someone brought up a moment ago on the panel, I believe, or someone asked a question about uh, the inspiration of the Bible and so on. I, f I believe that if we as gospel preachers and members of the church will work on this understanding what the Bible is and it's the inspiration of the Bible and have convictions on that, I think it, and then approach these people from the inspiration of the Bible, we're going to have to prove to them that there's a higher authority than just what's in their minds, for example. And uh, the Bible is the Word of God, and to prove that it's a book that is inspired, then that proves that God is its author. But we're going to have to prove that the Bible itself is inspired. I think we need to do more preaching on that. I think that's what brings in this liberalism we have in the church today. People don't believe the Bible. We've got to preach the Bible and teach the Bible, and then we can answer these questions brought up by these, these people. I remember years ago when I was in Japan, I was trying to teach someone the truth. He was a Buddhist, and I knew that he would never accept the information I'd give to him from the Bible. He wouldn't he, would, he didn't believe in Acts 2.38 or any other passage. I started out in the Old Testament, for example. I brought out these uh, prophecies that were given by the Old Testament prophets all the way up through the New Testament. About the third night of the meeting, while well, he threw up his hands, sitting across the table from me, and he said, Fantastic. That's amazing. I had no idea that the Bible was such a great book. And I think first we've got to have a foundation. We've got to have something to build from. And that's the thing on all of these things that you're talking about. And these people got these peculiar ideas in their mind. People be lost if they believe them. We've got to find a basis. We can't just run around just like a, you know, a chicken with his head cut off. We've got to have something to begin with and then stay with it. That's my thought. I just dropped, dropped that thought to you. 1997, Oh, how I love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. The entrance of God's word giveth light to giveth understanding to the simple in verse 130. Uh, there, when there needs to be more burning of the books of witchcraft, Acts 19:19, 19, 19, and more studying of the book. Uh, one of the spiritual sort of lectureship books, pardon me for making a bit of play on the spiritual sort here, it was the inspiration of the Bible. Y'all still have some of those over there for sale. I'm not getting a penny off of this, but I would recommend that you see Brother Laws after services and let him take some orders on that wonderful lectureship book on the inspiration of the Bible. That really is what is at the discussion between the New Age movement or any other uh, Eastern religion versus uh, God and the inspiration of the Bible. I wish I would share his microphone. In the New Age movement, that truth is relative and that there is no truth. They say now, I'm searching for truth. They, they don't believe there is any truth, but they say they're searching. They used to say, if it feels good, do it. Now they say, if it feels good, believe it. They say they're searching for truth. So maybe the point we can bring up with them is, what is truth? 
I'll find it. I'll, I'll share. I got two. Thank you. I find it ironic that the very life that the New Age movement seeks, pursues, the peace, the beauty, the tranquility, all the wonderful things the Bible sets forth. This is the message of the scripture, the golden rule, uh, all the principles of the Beatitudes. You know, Paul says, you're our epistle, known and read of all men. I'm going to go to the section. We've got to preach the inspiration of the Bible, preach it fervently, and I believe the lives of true Christians is the greatest sermon of all of its inspiration. I think the points that are all being made about inspiration are going to be the answer. You've got to get back to that standard. But a problem I think we're going to be facing, and, and, and a question that I'm to get in my own mind, it's hard to preach or teach inspiration to someone who does not even share the same idea of God as you do. But now let's get back to an even more basic point. What about the concept of morality? Uh, I've done very little reading. What view do some of these people have regarding murder, child abuse, uh, the very basic elements regarding morality, what are their views there? And then maybe might not we approach that point of view into seeing why they feel that way, as if Mike says. Style of some of these people like Shirley McLean and them, and you'll see the answer to your question very quickly. Uh, I mean, they do not believe in the standard of morality that the Bible teaches at all. And again, this is an, an abandonment of, uh, like Brother Larry's pointed out, the, the Beatitudes and every moral teaching of our Lord, and they simply are making up their own religion to satisfy themselves. But all of this goes back to uh, the existence of God in the inspiration of the Bible. And we're, we're having a society today uh, that more and more is becoming anti-God and, and anti-Christ and anti-Bible. feeds those children who puts clothes on their back, who builds the hospitals. People with this type of views, why would they? If that's what they're destined to live, they've got to live that way, they've got to, they've got to pay that price and, and be afflicted and suffer so that they can be better off the next time. Why would they do any? Why would they help at all? I heard one of them one day proclaiming, you know, Mother Teresa did such good work with those starving children. When that person, that new age person, didn't even realize it's their kind of doctrine that's causing those starving children and losing their fingers and breaking their limbs just to make them better beggars. So where's the morality? And yes, that's a good point if we can get the morality to them. But again, how can you if they think everything's relative and you can't really know anything for sure? I wonder if Max is his great-great-great-granddaddy when he was out hunting rattlesnakes. <laughs> you know, the Hindu, I noticed the Hindu, the orthodox Hindu, why they wear the gauze around their face? They don't want to suck up an insect. It might be Uncle Tom working his way back up on the chain or something. I'm Dick Case, and the question that I have concerning, uh, like the new force that we're talking about, and certainly those of us who are Christians, it, we can distinguish between that. But we have a generation of young people that are growing up on that, the question that I would ask, how do we handle that with really teaching our young people uh, the fact that the force is not God, that we need to distinguish between the fantasy there and the truth as it's revealed in God's Word. I believe the Bible gives us the answer that we as parents must teach our children in the days of their youth, uh, before they become conscious of Luke Skywalker and the Force and all of these things, which comes at a very early age now, the existence of God, the supremacy of God, the reality of God, and lay a foundation as they grow up that they have something to fall back on and rely upon uh, to maintain faith in God and not in these. Uh, Moses told Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and love the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul and strength and mind, and teach these things to your children when you rise up in the morning, when you go by the way at night, teach the word daily, regularly, emphatically, by word and by life. Ditto. Oh. 
I have a granddaddy or had a granddaddy who preached for a number of years. He made an observation about people. He said, if you build your road into the woods where you found a stump filled with water and you'll paint the rocks back in that way and charge people a dollar to come in there and worship, you'll be a millionaire in a year. Uh, because that's what people want. Anything that's strange, anything that's different, anything that's a little new. But I guess the point that bothers me most about the new age, and uh, we've dealt with it to some extent here, the heaven's gate end of it, uh, the taking of, of life. You mentioned a while ago the UFO phenomenon and, and people believing in the, the being picked up and taken to another planet as part of, of their religious experience or whatever it is that you call it. Are we going to see a rise in this kind of thing because of the influence of the New Age movement, because of mysticism and things like that? Or is this something that's going to burn out given a course of time? The year 2000 draw closer. First of all, we're going to see more lessons on premillennialism by the denominational world than we've ever seen in our entire life. Number two, you'll see more of these uh, groups, the New Agers, really make start pushing their doctrine even heavier. Uh, back... Uh, when uh, the first turn, uh, when 1,000, the year 1,000 rolled around, a lot of people jumped off buildings and, and committed suicide in very other ways and all. And you'll see a lot of these uh, far-out religions taking advantage of what they believe is the end of the world, things like that. Just like over here in Dallas, uh, oh, not long ago, there's a group from Japan, isn't that correct? That are saying that the end of the world is going to be in March sometime and Jesus Christ is going to come back in bodily form and all that. And, of course, they don't know that. Mark 13, 32 uh, so states that. But I, I believe that uh, it goes back. It goes back to what we've been stating. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. 1 Corinthians 1, 21. Nothing takes the place of the preaching of the Word of God. Brother Harvin Nichols is back in the back. And uh, his uh, father, Brother Gus Nichols, was a man that preached thousands of sermons. And I have no idea how many people obeyed the gospel. But the reason they obeyed the gospel, he didn't deal in philosophy and things of that nature. He just preached the Bible, preached the Bible, preached the Bible. And that's going to make the difference right there. I don't know how he did it without a crystal. <laughs> I don't know that the Heaven's Gate was, was that much into the New Age movement because of their basic in belief that they were going to heaven. That they weren't being reincarnated or anything of that nature. So they had, it wasn't truly a true New Age movement, I don't believe. Because of the end result, the way that they looked at the end result. Any more questions? I think our time's about gone. Uh, I'm sorry. I need to say one thing as far as mine. As far as Christians and reincarnation, we don't look to reincarnation. We look to the resurrection. We don't have to worry about coming back the next life to pay for our sins. Jesus Christ came to pay for our sins. And if we'll obey his will, all those sins will be washed away. And we're thankful that God is who he is and Jesus is God. He didn't have to come back and go through it a bunch of times and get brownie points and get it right. He had it right. And if we'll follow him, we can be right too.